you out a bunch of, um, I put some papers on your tables if you want more information about the books and topics that he has um, spoken about before. He's a former graduate school professor and a consultant to numerous organizations. He's a published author of 20 or probably 30 books by now. 58. 58 <laughs> books by now. Five books. The rest of the chapters are all right. We're happy to have him here, needless to say. Um, in addition to a doctorate in clinical psychology, Dr. Manianchi has a master's in counseling psychology and has completed a postdoctoral internship in marriage and family treatment. Like I said, we've had him here at MOPS um, several times over the years and have greatly benefited from his wisdom and encouragement. So I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Michael Manianchi. And then just one really quick thing. I know we are, this is the first time we're videotaping, so we can, for moms that aren't here, we can, can watch it. So just, you know, just remember that we are videotaping, so if it's not a question you wanted online or on our Facebook page, then just remember that. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for having me out. Can you hear me without the mic? As I always say, I'm the youngest born from an Italian family. From the Bronx, New York, I have no trouble being heard. <laughs> As you heard, this is going to be posted online. I would like you to ask questions at any time. Raise a hand, throw something at me. Just remember, you will be archived forever. <laughs> so if you're going to ask about your husband, turn it off. <laughs> We're here to talk about the 10 most common mistakes good parents make. The 10 most common mistakes good parents make. Let us begin with a very easy principle. I used to be a high school teacher, an English teacher. I love English. I still write a great deal. I'm an editor for a couple of journals, or on the editorial board now, I should say. Words mean a lot to me. What is the definition of a mistake? Right out of the Oxford English Dictionary. What's a mistake? Something you didn't mean to do. The key is it's unintended. If inten <coughs> intention is involved, it's not a mistake, it's a choice. If I'm reaching for the milk and I knock over a glass of water, that is a? If I swindle someone and get caught, I can't stand before the judge and say, I made a mistake. That is called a choice. That is intentional, deliberate. If you want to see, it is not part of this workshop, but is a delightful book about how our language has been changed. It is called, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. It is a wonderful book that analyzes high-profile apologies and explanations in sports, in politics, in entertainment, and it breaks it apart grammatically. It's a fascinating book to see how people are not apologizing. They're just pretending they are. It is an important distinction because what I'm going to show you today, after my 33 years in this field, are the 10 most common mistakes that parents don't intend to make. You know it is a mistake because once you become aware of it, you stop. You just stop. You don't do it again. Education stops it. Information changes behavior. If it does not change the behavior, now that you know and you believe, I agree with him, I think that's a mistake. You enter a new category, choice is involved. If you continue to choose something you know is a mistake, that is when it becomes, can you read that word? A problem. I will have a lot to say about that a little later, but I need to lay some groundwork. 
Shall we begin? Okay. These are in no particular order except for the first one. That is by far overwhelmingly the most common. Drum roll, please, on the big David Letterman band. The first most common mistake I see good parents make is they try and do it all now. We try to have it all, be it all, do it all now. Why is that a parenting mistake? Let me explain. When we try to do it all, have it all, be it all, that next word, when, simultaneously, we cut one. The first thing we cut is this. That's American Sign Language for the signs of sleep. We elongate our days. We just cramp more in and cut out sleep. That leads to all sorts of problems. One of my favorite books on family therapy, Frank Pippin, the book is called Turning Points. He has the chapter on new parents. One of my favorite two-word sentences in the English language. Babies leap. What he wants to introduce right there at the beginning is the notion that parenting is not always efficient, it's not always neat, it's not always clean, it's messy, and we need to take time to deal with the mess. When we want to do it all, have it all, a cognitive shift happens. This starts to guide our lives. What is it? We must stick to schedule. Because if I don't stick to the schedule, if I don't stick to the routine, how am I going to get it? All in. So, sticking to the schedule becomes more important than evolutionary theory. Adaptation. I sometimes have to stop and deal with what is ahead of me. So if you have a two-year-old, a three-year-old who's struggling to put on his shoes, at that moment, the good parenting technique might be let him struggle. But we have to stick to what? Schedule. So I find myself kneeling down and doing it for him. We stick to schedule, but a teaching moment is lost. Something I'll talk about a little later. Your daughter is upset. It might be appropriate to take an extra two, three minutes to do some emotion coaching and talk to this young lady. But we have to what? So it just be sitting on the we got to get in the car. I find that many parents are not only sleep deprived, not only too tired, they're too pressured to stick to routine, to get everything in. When that happens, good parenting skills start to drop off. And we all pay the price for that later. The bad news, you're not going to get it all now. You probably will over the course of 10 years, 15 years. You will probably do it all. But it is a marathon, not a sprint. Pace yourself, which means the bad news again. Say no. This week, we're going to emphasize cleaning up the house a little more. So maybe let go of some of the socializing. This week, we're going to do more of the socializing. Maybe I'm not going to go to the gym as often and work out. Okay, this next week, we're going to work out. Maybe I'm going to let go of some of the tutoring and the extra stuff I'm going to do with the kid. You hear that? Let go of some things. You'll get to them later. But many of the parents I work with would rather have their upper lip hold up over their forehead, then say one magic word. No. One of the first
first things I ask, especially your age range, when you come in to see me, is how much time do you sleep in? It's amazing what looks like attentional problems, what looks like a mood problem, chronic anxiety, with two to three nights of eight to ten hours sleep in a row, all of a sudden it seems to fail. You hear me? <laughs> the next thing, after, yeah, people have a daddy to that <laughs> The next thing we cut when we try to do it all is we don't spend time in our relationships. We cut that. So take your time, slow down, touch base with your significant other, which I hope is your husband. <laughs> Number two, confusing a developmental stage with misbehavior. I have a master's degree in counseling psychology, a doctor in clinical psychology, but we must give the pediatricians and the developmentalists their due. They're more on the biological side. There is a fairly consistent timetable to when children can do certain things. And again, I have a Michigan Avenue in Chicago practice, and I'm in downtown Naperville. We call ourselves Naperville's. You know, when we're talking about Parker and Forest and Grange, Cape Salem, I was in <laughs> uh, Gurney last week, and last night I was in. Oh, what is that town? Somewhere near Alaska. It begins with an M. It's gone already. I was at 10 o'clock last night for workshops. I hear all these parents come to me and say, I have my kid in this accelerated program. I'm like, really? Are you raising him or racing him? Slow down. There is a timetable for a reason. Children, four years old, are not going to learn math. You hear this? Don't bother with the flashcards. <laughs> Let it go. Remember the Mozart effect? Everyone do this. Do this. Do this. Come on. And now this. That's American Sign Language for BS. <laughs> it is. There is a Mozart effect. Listening to classical music in group? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Do you hear that? It doesn't. Let it go. Children will learn when they're ready. Don't waste your time. Most children aren't ready to learn anything of significance till third grade. Most, I'm not kidding, I was a teacher. My undergraduate degree is in English literature and education. First, second grade should be simply socializing the kid, working with the kid. Don't drill the kid too hard, guys. It won't stick. The child will memorize, not learn. The learning just isn't there. Let me give you a common example. 80% of what we learn in our entire lives, we learn before we're three years old. 80%. The vast majority of that is simply language, which lays the architecture down for most thinking. Children under the age of three are information vacuums. They want to suck up everything and learn. What most parents think is misbehavior under the age of three is stimulation seeking. They just want to explore. They don't want to be taught. Do you hear the difference? They want to go out and and touch and hope. They don't want to be sit there and instructed. They're, they're biologically not capable to sit that long. Even most kindergartners and first graders should not be sitting. They should be getting up. Why? Wandering. We're asking too much. But we think it's misbehavior. Let me show you an easy way 
and keep this in mind. I'm a two-year-old. That is a big screen TV. Tell me, my teeth don't touch the TV. <laughs> now you're sitting right here with my parents, right? Watch. <laughs> Did everyone see that? <coughs> now watch this. Say it again. <laughs> Did you see the difference? The first child's not misbehaving. She's bored. She's looking for something to do. Don't discipline her. Redirect her. The second one, that's misbehaving. Saying, this town ain't big enough for you and me. <laughs> Draw. And that child needs some limit setting, discipline, and direction. Learn very basic developmental stages. Don't push the kids. Don't beat them with flashcards and this and that. Let them explore. Let them go out and get dirty and messy. That's one of the best things you can do for children under the age. Three, I'll, I will stay back here and hide when I say this. Over control. I know I'm speaking to suburban moms. This is blasphemy. I just told you to take your baby and smash its head. Over control. What do I mean by over control? Did I say control? No. What did I say? Listen to me. If at any time in your life you were voted most likely to carry your own casket to the grave, <laughs> ask me why. <coughs> so it would be done right. That might be your issue. When was the last time any of you were actually on a roller coaster like your great America? Remember? You know that moment. You sit down and the bar comes down. You know that sound? Click, 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 click. Show me what you do when the bar comes down. Now, I look deeply into the eyes of the people who work there. Yes, check the bar. You hear me? But once you know it's locked, let go. Why hold on? Should the roller coaster jump the tracks, we'll find your burning, twisted body still holding on. But I know, you all say to me, but I'm holding on, it will keep everything safe. No. Once you know it's locked, raise your hands and let go. If you still hold on, it might be an over-control issue. My other favorite one, if you know the right way to hang toilet paper, you hear them laugh, look at someone. You hear her? What do I mean now? Over-control is the belief that we control our children. We don't. Any parent who controls her children is either intimidating the child or intimidating the child. It's a joke. Children need to control themselves. Our mission is to teach them self-control. If we're not teaching them self-control, we are over-controlling. You agree. Thank you. <laughs> Power to the people. You see, every teacher, every therapist, every parent has one goal in time, to make ourselves as useless as possible, as quickly as possible. There's a delightful story of a priest, a minister, and a rabbi who get together to have a debate when life begins. And the priest says, it's obvious when the sperm fertilizes the egg. And the minister says, oh, my friend, I know you mean well, but it's at birth with the first breath of the Lord's air. And the rabbi scratches his chin and says, you two don't get it. Life begins when the dog dies and the kid moves out. <laughs> Our mission is to get them what? Out as early as possible. Let them control themselves. We should come in and control situations, 
not people. We all respond to a corporate range in this situation, so this angel tells us to get hurt. But then she is responsible for wandering in there and maybe scraping the knee. That's okay. She needs to learn. Wow, don't do that. That's a good lesson. I'd rather the child learn that way than us saying, don't do that. Because then every time the child explodes, you see the child's head turn to look at us to say whether it's safe or not. No, figure it out. I managed the situation. I took the pit bull and put him away. I swept the broken glass off. Now wonder, I managed the situation, you explode. Make sense? I made it safe, but not perfectly safe. Don't go for control. Power to people. Which gets me to number four. I am so far behind on the list. Again, interrupt me anytime, throw something at me, ask questions. Yes, ma'am. What about the lady who fell out and died on the road? Holding on didn't help. psychiatrist Alfred Adler was approached and asked to write an article for a Viennese medical journal. What predisposes children to develop psychological problems as they age? He asked a number of experts. He was one of them. He had the most cogent, brilliant article. Here's what he wrote. There are three situations in which children become, in the language of the 1930s, overburdened. Number one, in the language of the 1920s, organ inferiority. We would now call that some biological genetic predisposition. They did not understand inheritance and gen uh, genetics the way we do now. But if you're born with something up, it increases the chances that you might develop problems. It doesn't guarantee it, but statistically it raises the probability. Everyone said, Dr. Adler, brilliant. What's your second point? He said, abusing women, neglecting the child. Everyone said, wonderful, makes sense. What's the third? He said, the third was the most pernicious, the most dangerous thing you can do to a child. Pamper it. And they went, excuse us? What do you mean? He said, pamper it. And he defined pampering doing anything for children on a consistent basis they're capable of doing for themselves. That's overindulgent. Therefore, what is neglect? Not doing for children on a consistent basis what they're not capable of doing for themselves. Now he wrote, when in doubt, get it right. <laughs> Meet them where they're at. Notice you have to understand this concept. Developmentally, where are they at? So you know what is pampering versus what is neglect. But if you're in doubt, he said, err on the side of neglect. It will become obvious the kid can't do it. You can then step in. But if you step in too quickly, it'll never become obvious that you're stepping in too quickly. And very few children will say, stop, you're doing too much for me. Instead, they tend to say, Garçon, feel my appetite. <laughs> they don't have parents that have ballet. 
Now, why is Pamphim so bad? He was at his brilliant insight. He said in all his years of practice, he had met many neglected and abused children who didn't know they were neglected and abused. They just thought life was hard, so what did they have to do? Hard. But he said he had never met a panther child who didn't grow up feeling neglected and abused. Why? Because they're so used to life saying yes, the first time life says no, they have the same emotional reaction as if you just abused them. So if every morning just for waking up, I give you a bag of m ms how would you feel the first morning that I didn't give you the bag? Neglected, you hear that? So the irony is, Adler points out, the more we do for kids, the higher their expectations get, and as soon as we say no, they have the emotional reactions if we just boil them. Oh, there's a race. Next thing he said is, children who grow up overindulged tend to make war with normal. Isn't that an interesting phrase? They see normal, therefore, as neglectful. And you know who gets, Adler said, the dirty task of introducing normal to them? Take a guess. Look what's on her shirt. The teachers, when they show up, and the teachers don't have the time or the resources to <coughs> handle them, they go, what is this? You hear? And hence, he opened 30 parenting clinics in the Viennese school system starting in 1924. The first day to do this. When in doubt, step back, watch the kid. That'll tell you. Five. Let me give you a history lesson quickly. But first, the reality check. How are we doing? Is this making sense? No, we don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, Mom, are you here? No. <laughs> My mother's long deceased. That wouldn't stop her from showing up anyway, trust me. I'm going to oversimplify. I teach in a couple of different colleges and universities, for example, marriage and family therapy. You're interested in an eight hour, 12 hour, 15 hour course in this, come see me. I'll show you where. For now, I'm going to give you a 10 minute overview. There are three basic parenting styles, three different ways adults relate to children. First, autocratic. In an autocratic system, it is parent based. All that means is that the seat of power and control flows through the adults down. So that the common response you hear in an autocratic home is, because I said so. Billy, pick up your stuff. Mary, now. You hear the tone? Down. If you are interested, I will give you the historical and philosophical roots of this system. Otherwise, I'll move on. You want it or keep going? Keep going. Second, permissive. This is a system that is child-based. In here, the tendency is towards indulging the children. That is, I must follow you. Got the two strategies? So here you will find children getting hardcore flashcard training early on. 
having extremely regimented days, being told what to do. In here, the houses can be rather apparently disorganized. They're not, but I don't want to interrupt the child. The child determines the schedule. You will see these homes breastfeeding, for example, may continue for years. Family beds, the child's allowed to come in whenever. We shouldn't say why. No, until the child decides. Third, democratic. This is where the power is shared equally between the parents and the children. Until you get issues of emergency or high conflict, then the parents take over. Make sense? Until then, we vote. We discuss. We contract. We debate. All three systems have their strengths and weaknesses. My bias is for the Democratic. It's the best research, most consistent one we know of. But it's also the hardest to maintain. Guess of the three, which is the worst? Let's take a vote. How many vote for number one, autocratic? How many vote for number two, permissive? Okay. What the research says, drum roll. Doing all three. <laughs> Inconsistent parenting style. If you're gonna pick one, stay there. If you're gonna be autocratic at 9 a.m., be autocratic at 9 p.m. If you're gonna be permissive at 8 a.m., stay that way and be permissive at 8 p.m. You're going to be Democrats say, What drives children crazy is what I affectionately refer to as parenting based upon the wheel of moves. Where does it land today? The typical pattern I see is this. We start out every morning Democratic. Let's talk, let's negotiate, let's vote. What would you like for breakfast? Do you hear this? What would you like to wear today? By dinner time, we're tired. That's it. I will get a green leafy substance in one orifice of your body, even if it kills you. By bedtime, I don't care. Set yourself on fire. You just go to bed. We've shifted to permissive. Do you hear that? What the research shows, it tends to increase anxiety in children. They're never sure the response they're going to get from us of green light versus yellow light versus red. They can't figure out the logic. Take one position and what? Stay there. I will have more to say about this soon. Yes? Someone asked, she finds herself being one way during the week when there are more constraints and yet more permissive during the weekends. I don't know, does it work for your family? First question. Second, you may find you have mis more misbehavior during the week. Then you're okay. I will give you a decision tree about that in about 10 minutes if you hang on. But you see, I have my doctorate in the science. We form a hypothesis of what? Test it out. I have to see in your family what's happening. Is it working? Yes, ma'am. Sit down, sit up, be polite. How do you behave in the gym? You can run, scream, right? 
Well, that means in different situations you have to behave differently. Well, you're going to find that in school. Some teachers like it one way, some teachers like it the other. Dad does things one way, I do things differently. If you don't like the way dad handles it, don't misbehave. And put it on. If you and your spouse can get together on the same age, that would be great. If you can't, the child will know that. Play a game called Let's You and Him Fight. <laughs> yes. Right. But I'll have more to say about that at number seven. I need to lay a little more ground. Number six. I am a psychologist. I am psychologically an open child. I like control. I did have siblings, but they were so much older. The nearest to me was nine years old. And then, when he was older, so I mean, I mean, not older. So I grew up basically an open child. I like work. I like structure. You can see the way I write. I hope you can hear the way I think. I'm a control freak. That said, we the same. Too much structure. We're killing creativity. And I got this from George Carlin. I loved him. Brilliant man. He was inducted into the Comedy Hall of Fame. And the men who introduced him as the first class ever, the first class if you want trivia was Lenny Bruce, Richard Pryor, and George Carlin. Nice class. Lenny Bruce was deceased. Richard Pryor was disabled. He couldn't get to the enough. So George Carlin did. And it was brilliant. The man who introduced him was at the time a 25 year old comic, up and coming, nobody had heard of him, John Stewart. You should have seen him, he was a baby. And Carlin's keynote address was the death of creativity. And here's what he said Have you ever noticed TV sucks? Movies are getting bad. You know why? We don't throw kids in the backyard and say, go play, come back when you bleed or hungry. We give them a coloring book and say, say in the lines. We arrange playdates. We bring out toys for them. We arrange t-ball. We don't allow them to develop what? Creativity. You see, I heard this and I was like, he nailed me. He got me and my parenting mistake. Children need structure. They should have structure. It should be consistent. It should be planned. But within the structure should be some periods throughout the day where there is no structure. Go explore the cabinets. Remember I said control the situation? I've got nothing dangerous in there. Nothing I think you would break and damage. So go explore. Let them develop creativity. And classic Harlan, he looked over his bifocals at the audience, he goes, and all you people who think I'm an enemy can be talking about the artists. Scientists need creativity too. And he quoted Einstein. Imagination is more important than intelligence. If we don't allow them to stumble, to make messes, to get dirty, if it's too structured, they grow up either, as Carl said, automatons, who are waiting for people to structure for them, or hyper rebellious, wanting to tell authority, Bite me. Just say it. It feels good. Bite me. She wants to say it. Keep an eye on her. Which gets me to number seven. Making sense thus far? Now remember, I don't know your kids' developmental stage. Some of you are newborns. Some of you are a year old. Some of you are three years old. Some of you have bad allergies. Some of you have had the flu. You hear that's going to change the structure. Some kids can handle 30 minutes of structure time. Some kids can only handle 15. Some can only handle two. You gotta know your kid. You gotta know where he's at, where she's at. Number seven. Trying to win too many battles. Trying to win too many battles. See earlier over control. Children need to win some battles. Which ones? Let me show you. You men, and you had alluded to something earlier, you have, let me explain. Ah. 
How's the resolution? Can you get the green? Imagine these three boxes. Box one, notice the relative size. Box two, notice the relative size. And box three is the biggest. In box one, let us put issues labeled health and safety. In box two, issues we will label core family values. Box three, everything else. So what's box one? Health and safety. What's box two? Box three? Now follow my line. When it comes to issues of health and safety, you approach that autocratically, without a lot of choices. It is our responsibility to protect them. It is our responsibility to keep them safe. You hear that? You don't say, would you like to be hit by the bus so we can? <laughs> Offer a choice to the kid. No, you drag her somewhere and drag her out of the way of the cab. No choices, no debate, no negotiating. Got it? But box two, core family issues, what you and your partner think are the key things you want to impress upon your children. You approach those democratically, negotiating. It increases the chances they'll hear your values. You want a kid to rebel, say, you will practice the piano three hours a day, every day. Very likely, sooner or later, the kid's going to do this to you. I'll explain why in a moment. You increase the chances if you say, Carrie, Dad and I were talking, we love music. We'd like to introduce you to music. What you play, how long you play, how long before you get to quit, how long you practice, we'd like to negotiate and debate with you. Come on, let's go try different, tell us what you like. We'd like you to look at the piano, but if you're drawn towards the drums or the trombone or the guitar, you hear this? So music is the value, you tell me how to fulfill it. The chances go up tremendously. Then what will you do, Carrie? I'll probably play the drums. <laughs> <laughs> I was forced to play piano and I quit it. I want to play the drums. Do you hear her language? What was her verb? Force. You see what I mean? Because we came over controlling. So, but if you want them to hear your values, define the parameters and give them movement within. Got it? In business, it's all participatory management. <coughs> Why is this important? Because you don't want them to set up a value as a competitor. Let me explain. I'm dad, you're mom. That's our child. If we look at her and say, school or not, school or not, she might hear the importance of school. But she might hear something else. We value school more than. So the only way she's going to test that we truly love her is to do what in school? Children who feel values are hit too sternly, too intensely, start to set that value up as a competitor. You like that value more than? That's where they'll keep us. That is the roadmap for where to rebel. Make sense? You don't want to do that. You want them to hear it, not feel that that value is more important to them. Try an experiment. Emphasize to your kids for one day, really hard. Keeping clean, keeping clean, keeping clean. Guarantee you, what will they do by the end of the day? Roll in the dirt and run. Same thing, emphasize. Short hair, short hair, short hair. What will they do? You ever hear Ray Don Chom, a comedian, actress? You know who her father is? Cheech and Chom, Tommy Chom, one of the big potheads in the world. She's anti-drugs. She goes out and does the commercials, the infomercials. She rebelled against pot. Her father did it. So she now, and did it too much, and hit that box up. She went the other direction. It happens all the time. 
What's box three? Matching it permissively. Lay back, mellow. Do you hear that? Because you're winning the main war. Box one and two. The kid's not putting himself at risk. The kid is buying into most of the family values. So the rest can be called small stuff. Let it go. Does that mean you don't discipline? Of course you do. But you don't have to hit it intensely. And that one you don't have to hit consistently. Box three stuff. What I often find is, parents hit box three, guess where I'm going? As if it were box one. Therefore, box one loses its importance. If everything is that intense, nothing is that important. I don't want you to lose your cookies, yell, scream, unless you really need it. Save it for the crucial issues. Then the kid will say, wow, mom never loses it. This must be. Otherwise, if everything is that important, they develop a strange neurological condition, parent deafness. Does that make sense? That's what I mean by too many battles. You'll be amazed how many parents come to see me and they say, is he doing drugs? Is he running in traffic? Is he sneaking out at night? Is he doing it? No, no, no. Is he going to school? Yeah. Is he respectful? Yeah. Whatever your values are. Then trust me, we'll get to it. Let's have a sense of humor. Number eight. On the handouts, Mary very graciously passed out. Is that how you get a hold of me? You'll notice I do workshops on emotion coaching. It is important to empathize with children, to teach them to be aware of their feelings. It is very important. That is not a common mistake I find when parents make. I find this the opposite. They are swayed by their children's emotions. And they teach children that emotionality is synonymous with problem solving. Are emotions important? Of course they are. Should we be empathic towards our children? Of course we should be. But we shouldn't always be swayed because sometimes there are more important things in solving a problem than how we feel. Like, what is the responsible thing to do? What is the law? Have you made a commitment? Sometimes that's more important than how you feel. They listen to people, sometimes it isn't. But you have no idea I'm going to snap my head in the wall. If I get one more kid come into my office and say, or adult, when I ask, Mary, why did you do that? I felt like it. And I say it quite respectfully, but feelings aren't reasons. And they look and be like, what do you mean? I understand you're tired and you don't want to go to practice today, but did you not make a commitment they promised to this team? If you do not go, they will lose the game. They don't have enough kids. So it's okay to be tired. I get tired too. But right now, maybe commitments more more. You hear yeah. that? Many parents are going to be like, you're cycling my child's emotions. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it is. Does this make sense? You need to know your kids. When is it appropriate to follow their feelings and let that be the decisive factor in solving this problem? I don't know when it is. You've got to talk to me. I've got to know the situation. Is it a one in a rarity? You're never tired, you're never asked to mispractice. You know what? That's good judgment on your part. I'll listen to that mispractice. But if it's starting to become a pattern, then I'm sorry. You made a promise, you're hurting your teammates. Number nine. Being too focused on children's grades. For most of you, that's not an issue given the age of the children you have. It is a big problem. I know you won't believe me. I will say it. Grades are meaningless. Don't even pay attention. Never look at a report card. Never. It's meaningless. You should know what your child is reading. You should be in charge, I'm sorry, involved in your child's parent-teacher conferences. You should be involved in the PTA. Go to the parent 
inspired me to support the teacher, read what your kids read, and hear this, and leave all of them to be grateful for them. We should be focused on their learning, not their grades. When do grades come? At the end. You see, we're already behind. I find this one is the key. When we're tired, when we're trying to do too much, the easiest way for us to convince ourselves we're involved is to check their what? I don't know how many of you have kids in elementary school or middle school. You know how much you can get online now? Looking at grades, homework assignments, never look. It's the child's responsibility. Remember what I said? The children have to be responsible. Learning is the key. I can't tell you how many kids I know who are straight-A students who haven't learned a thing. They memorize or cheated. I'd rather the kids struggle and get a B or a C. They got too much help from us and got an A. Don't focus on grades. Learning. What did you learn? Why did you learn that? What was useful about it? What is it? That's the key. Is it learning reflected by grades? Please, people. How many of you think grades are an accurate representation of learning? Sometimes yes, many times come out, guys. Maybe 45, 50 years ago, yeah, but have you heard of grade inflation? I don't trust grades. I don't trust an F or a D any more than I trust an A. I want to know what you'll learn. Check out this very interesting debate, pds.org. Have you ever heard of Intelligence Squared? It's a wonderful debate show hosted by John Donvan. This month was held at the Spurkus College of Judaicon, Michigan Avenue in Chicago. The debate was, are too many kids going to college? Fascinating debate. Four scholars had a very intelligent, polite, respectful debate, and all four agreed, Wow, grades have gone off the mark. Don't even pay attention to them. Including the president of Northwestern University, who is one of the debaters. Fascinating debate. Intelligence squared. Are too many people going to college? Just look at this debate. And number 10, drum roll. I'd like you to look around the room. Look at your faces. Everybody, look at my face. Look at each other. Come on. Do you notice something? We're old. <laughs> it's over. We had our childhood. It's done. It's their turn. It's their child. The ten most common mistakes your parents make. We attempt to repair issues from our childhood through them. It's their childhood. If I didn't study the piano the way I thought I should have, why should my child take piano lessons? She may want to do drums. You hear that? If I wasn't social enough, I shouldn't force my kid to be what? I should find out what my kid wants to do. Maybe my kid wants to be social. This is democratic, a negotiation. What do you want? What do I want? Let's find the middle ground. If it's not a health and safety issue, I shouldn't impose myself on you. You hear that? If it's not a box three, I shouldn't back off either. It's, you know, share. You want to have bacon every morning for breakfast. No. <laughs> I want to give you quinoa and granola. No. Can we find a middle ground? Do you see that? But what I often find is, in an attempt to fix something, we try to jump in and fix their childhood, which is really an attempt to fix our own. Now, you remember earlier, I asked you to think about something. The difference between a mistake and a problem. Remember that? How many of you have found this helpful today? Thank you, you're very kind. If it was in some of these clips, go home and stop. Silent. Just stop. 
If you say, I know he's right, I've looked up the research, he's got a point, but you keep doing it. Remember what I'm calling that, a what? A problem, you're consistently making a choice you know is a mistake. This is why. That's why mistakes become problems, because it has something to do with your childhood you haven't resolved. When you say, if I know it's a mistake, why do I keep doing it? Because you're still working out something with your mom. You're still working out something with your sibling. You're still working out something with that third grade teacher who gave you a hard time. Through your If any of this was helpful, stop. If you find, why am I still controlling so much? Look back. Where did that come from in your history? What are you still working out? Because trust me, your kid doesn't see it. He doesn't see you have a control issue. He just thinks you're mom. Talk to your family. Talk to your spouse. Talk to your friends. Ask them, you met my mom. Do you think I need to sort some things out with her? Got it? To sum up. We all make mistakes. The difference is catch them. Once you catch them, stop. If you can't stop, then pause. Look at your history. I never charge for calls. You have a question, call me. If nothing else, I'll tell you the latest joke. Just remember, if you get too specific, I can't get too specific if I haven't met the kid. That's like calling the mechanic and say, what happens when my car does this? He'll give you a general answer, but if you get too specific, he'll say, I don't know, I gotta see the car. But I have no problem, I'll spend five minutes. I'll just say, yeah, try this, look at this book, follow this. And if that doesn't work, I'll say, just ask me out. <laughs> You've been very gracious, thank you very much. I will leave these up. I finished the work, Monday line, that's where I was last night. That was haunting me. Parents came up, I did a different workshop, and they're taking on their smartphones all the charts I drew, pictures, and I was like, oh, people, over control. Let it go. And they find the space of their mind that's not your kid's ballet recital.